Okay, so we're going to do a little bit with the Google I.O. stuff tonight, so we're going to show the keynote at least, and then um, if we're interested in seeing some of the other stuff that Google announced in Google I.O., um, we'll just leave that up on the screen during our um, meet and greet cocktail hour afterwards. Um, so make sure you get a drink and hang out and, and chat, and we'll have those Google I.O. sessions going as well. Yeah? Does Google I.O. have all these sessions now, right? They do. Yep. Um, we do, and they're, they're at least in our slide deck, but we'll make sure that we post them on the Meetup site afterward. Okay, you know, right. um, if you Google Google I.O., of course, <laughs> they, they do a good job of indexing their own stuff. So, um, and lastly, before I step off, um, we want to thank you very much to Aprenda for hosting this. Thank you, Abe, and everyone here at Aprenda who's helped out. Ashley for setting up, and she's still in the room. Um, so there, there will be sponsors, um, and that's because uh, in addition to Google, this group needs some community involvement to stay uh, not only relevant, but to provide food and a venue. So uh, Aprenda is our first sponsor, and we're, we're hoping to maybe move the, move the meetup around to some other towns as well. Um, not just in Troy, so we could be in Albany, Schenectady, um, Saratoga, so this, there's a lot of great software companies in the entire region, so there may be more sponsors that come on board later. Um, but that said, just like the Google involvement, that doesn't mean that we're bound to any one particular technology or any one particular company or that any one particular technology or company runs the meetup. Um, we really, really want this to be a very general, general audience kind of thing um, where everyone gets involved in a lot of different stuff and just a great place for developers to come and meet up, um, whether we're here at a premise great space or in some other space in the future. Um, that said, thank you very much, Dave and Aprenda. This has been a fantastic place. So you see the agenda up here, basically, to fill in some of the gaps. So it's the fourth uh, part agenda. We'll go over the uh, recap of the special major announcements during IO 16 last, last week, like I mentioned. Uh, Chris also mentioned that. Um, and we'll talk about possible code labs that uh, we can point you guys at, or we can actively as a group over a long period of time, because um, those are pretty well curated uh, labs that are out there that um, are relatively short um, and digestible, so you can get a, your hands on some of this technology. And it turns out that some of them also integrate with um, the tech that's outside of uh, Google itself, so we'll give examples of that. Um, and then we'll see, we'll hear rather a technical presentation from Matt Miller here, a friend of architect, um, and we'll do uh, networking and gathering some of your feedback in small groups or um, you know, as a group prior to uh, breaking for the evening. So it's, it's, kind of the, it's kind of the plan. So uh, what, we, what we're showing here basically on the right-hand side, you'll see I've got a, kind of a, a tiled view of some of the major products or services that were announced at IO16. Um, in a moment here, I think uh, Chris is going to hit the link for uh, the um, IO16 over here. I'll actually see a condensed version from the Verge um, of the uh, keynote that was delivered at um, uh, 2016. IO conference, and um, at that point we'll be able to get a better feel for the announcements that were made during the conference and put this all in perspective. Hopefully we can skip this ahead shortly. Meet on a different kind of router that makes it simple to get better Wi-Fi.
lets you enjoy music and entertainment throughout your entire house, manage everyday tasks more easily, and ask Google what you want to know. With Google Home, we set out to create and design a beautiful product that's warm and inviting and fits naturally in many areas of the home. We think it'll be a beautiful addition to any room in your house. And we're even more excited about what it's gonna do for you. Google Home will be available later this year. Another core use case on users' phones is communications. But given our advancements in machine learning, we wanted to approach this core use case with a new perspective. Eric Kai is going to join to talk to you more about it. Communications is all about sharing life's moments. So today, we're giving you a look at what we've been up to with two new communication apps that show what's possible when we bring Google technology to this essential human activity. The first is a new messaging app called Allo. Allo is a smart messaging app. It learns over time to make conversations easier, more expressive, and more productive. We designed Allo to help you express yourself and keep the conversation going. Let's look at Whisper Shout. Rather than tapping the send button, he slides it down to whisper and slides it up again to shout. So down to whisper and up again to shout. Another way Allo helps you express yourself is by letting you type less. When Joy asks, dinner later, that Amin has offered two smart reply suggestions. I'm busy and I'm in. The more you use Allo, the better the suggestions will become. Now I want to show you something really cool. Allo even offers smart replies when people send photos to you. The intelligence behind smart reply also gives you a taste at how assistive technology can make your message experience simpler and more productive. The Google Assistant, built right into Allo, takes it even farther. So I'm pleased to introduce one of our leads, Rebecca, to tell you more about the Assistant in Allo. So as we had earlier, the Google Assistant is an ongoing dialogue between you and Google that helps you get things done in your world. So I'm going to show you how the Assistant can help in Amit and Joy's conversation. The Assistant intelligently recognizes that they could use some tips for Italian restaurants nearby. And you can see its proactive suggestion at the bottom of the screen there. In Allo, Amit and Joy can choose and reserve a restaurant right there in the chat in a natural and seamless way. You can also have a one-on-one -on -one chat with Google. And it's a big Real Madrid fan, and he wants to know how they got on in their last match. So we asked the assistant, did my team win? Looks like they did. And we can keep going like this and find more news about the team um, just by tapping on the suggestions there. So that was the assistant in Allo. Allo is all about messaging. But let me talk to you a minute about video call. So I'd like to introduce, introduce you to Duo simple one-to-one -one video calling app for everyone. Duo is the video, call, video companion to Allo. It's fast and performs well even on slow networks, and it works on both Android and iOS. But here's a feature that makes Allo really special. Knockout shows you a live video stream of the caller before you've even picked up. So as you can see, and Elena apparently too is popping in there, <laughs> I haven't even picked up yet but Ava's right there, smiling and making funny faces. I can tell she's really eager to talk, so let's answer it. Hi, Ken. Hi, Ava. Hi, Hi. Lena. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Both Allo and Duo will be available this summer on Android and iOS. To talk to you about a bit about Android, I'd like to invite to the stage our resident rock star, Dave Burke. Android is the most popular OS in the world. So let's talk about what's new <coughs> in the platform. Let's jump straight in and talk about some of the biggest changes it had around performance, security, and productivity. With N, we're making our biggest leap forward with the introduction of Vulkan. Vulkan is a modern 3D graphics API designed to give game developers direct control of the GPU to produce incredible graphics at compute performance. Second, we've added a new just-in-time or JIT compiler. And JIT compilation means that app installs are much faster, 75% faster in N. So now users can get up and running in your apps much more quickly. With N, we're continuing to strengthen our defenses in three key ways. First, N introduces file-based encryption. Second, we learned the importance last year of hardening the security of the media framework. Third, N automatically keeps your phone up to date 
with the latest version of the system software without you having to do anything. And that uh, pesky Android is upgrading dialog is finally gone. A third area of focus for us is our continued effort to improve productivity. So we decided to simplify it by automatically removing apps in the list that you haven't used in a while. Also, based on popular demand, we finally added a clear all button at the top. Notifications is another area we've worked on to improve productivity in Android. We've added a new direct reply feature, which lets you quickly reply to a message like so. And Android is the first mobile platform to support the new Unicode 9 emoji standard. Unicode 9 also brings 72 new emoji gifs. So now you can let your friends know, for example, when you're dancing like the left shark while juggling and eating avocado toast in order to win first prize in a selfie contest. <laughs> We're still putting the final touches on the end release, and we expect to launch it later this summer. There's one more area of M that we've been working hard on that we haven't talked about yet. And to tell you more about what it is, let me invite up Clay Bavor. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm Clay Bavor, and I lead the virtual reality team at Google. And yeah, just to get right to it, virtual reality is coming to Android N. Now, what we've built won't be available until this fall, but we'd like to introduce you to it today. We call it Daydream. Daydream is our platform for high-quality mobile virtual reality. In it are all of the ingredients you need to create incredible immersive VR experiences. So we've introduced what we call VR mode as part of Android N. We've worked at all levels of the Android stack to optimize it for VR. Now, this is obvious, but a, a VR headset is something that you wear. It has to have great optics, it has to be comfortable, like the controller, how you interact with VR. It's just as important. Let's have a look. That's it for VR and Android. To tell you about wearables in Android, I'd like to turn it over to David Singleton. And today, I'm sharing a preview of our biggest platform update yet, Android Wear 2.0. We know that the most important role of your watch is helping you stay connected to what matters. And that's why we're evolving the platform to build even better experiences for the watch face, messaging, and fitness. With Android Wear 2.0, apps can be standalone. That means the apps on your watch can have direct network access to the cloud. And that means a fast and richer on-watch app experience for both Android and iPhone users. Starting today, developers can download a preview of Android Wear 2.0, and everyone will be able to enjoy these exciting new watch experiences in the fall. Hi, everybody. I'm Ellie from the Android team. We'll be showing you a sneak peek of a new project. We're evolving Android apps to run instantly without installation. We call this Android Instant Apps. b and Photo and Video has a beautiful Android app, but I don't have it on my phone because I don't shop for cameras every day. With one tap, the app opens up right to the bag I want to buy. I can also swipe here and see more details about the bag. You should know that Instant Apps is going to be compatible all the way back to Jelly Bean. And with that, I'll hand it back to Sundar. Things previously thought to be impossible may in fact be possible. We look forward to building this future together with all of you. Thank you for joining us at Google Air. Hi, Dad. <laughs> We heard about a bunch of uh, new announcements, some of which are pre-announcements, it seems like, or upcoming throughout the year, and some of which are ready to go right now. Um, just kind of curious if we could um, maybe pause and, and take that survey again to see if anything that you saw up there during this uh, you know, condensed uh, keynote summary uh, changed your opinion about what you were interested in or expanded uh, your thoughts on that. Anybody uh, see anything up there particularly interesting maybe that we didn't talk about they'd like to get their hands on? Uh, Amazon Echo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Google Home. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't buy the Amazon one yet. Okay. So, uh, I realized they did say it was a pre-announcement too. So, so yeah. keep our eye on that. Yeah. Anybody see anything in terms of like mobile development, the instant app stuff, uh, or the preview? Um,
kind of functionality that looked intriguing? Does that provide any kind of benefit relative to iOS or anything like that? Security nightmare. <laughs> Security nightmare? <laughs>
Um, and it's a, a kind of like a total call and specification that Google's been pushing pretty hard. Um, you know, obviously anything that's good on the web is good for Google. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of stuff on here like that. There's some stuff that is specific to Google, like for example, all the stuff that we were just talking about. Um, so uh, Jason, if you could click back on the slides. Um, so uh, as you can see, Accelerate Mobile Pages is one of them. Um, progressive Web Apps, building a Node.js web app using the Google Cloud Platform. Um, an intro to Firebase, what we were just talking about. Um, building a Slack bot, again, with a Node.js server. Um, and this time on Kubernetes. Um, if you don't know what Kubernetes is, I think we're going to learn a little bit about it from Matt in a few minutes. Um, and then using Google Sheets as your application's reporting tool. So that, that would mean like using the, the Google Spreadsheet API to input data into a, a spreadsheet, which could be interesting in a lot of ways. Um, developing for Android TV, um, high-performance video for the mobile web, um, some more Firebase code labs, one specifically with a Swift SDK, um, and the iOS SDK. So uh, is anything you see on there strike your fancy is something you'd be interested in? Firebase stuff? Firebase. Yeah, a couple of Firebase things. Cool. Um, any of the Node.js cloud hosted applications? The Slack bot? Uh, yeah. Building bots, right? That's cool. Um, and then, so we, we mentioned, we, well, we left off web development and somebody brought it up. Thank you very much. And there's accelerated mobile pages and, and progressive web apps there. Yes, and nodding heads. Cool. Um, and then uh, the TV stuff. Um, building for Android TV. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I think that's it. And uh, so, <laughs> with, with that, Matt, we're ready for you. Um, hey, would you like to do an introduction before we get started? Um, sure. Uh, so first, I guess, again, thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Steve Sultan. Uh, I can give you a little bit of background of Apprenda. I'm one of the co-founders of Apprenda. Uh, if I know some of you were wondering what is it that Apprenda does. Um, and uh, to summarize it, we're basically an application platform that helps you uh, develop and operate applications a lot more efficiently. So typically we sell to large enterprises and they have a lot of applications that they build um, and our platform helps them build them and operate them a lot more efficiently than they normally would otherwise. Um, traditionally we were built for .NET and JVM based apps. Uh, but recently we made um, a, an announcement a, a commitment to Kubernetes. Have you heard of Docker? Anybody has heard of Docker? All right, uh, so Docker is a new packaging mechanism for, for building applications and, and packaging applications. And Kubernetes is a technology that, uh, that helps you run specifically Docker applications, again, efficiently efficient, as an orchestrator. Matt's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so without, Further ado, I want to introduce Matt Miller. Matt's one of our architects, and uh, please, uh, please welcome him. And he, he's going to talk to you about a bunch of cool stuff. So does your platform set up WebSphere? Does our platform what? Set up WebSphere. Does it set up WebSphere? Does it set up? Set up. Set up WebSphere. So our platform can support applications running on WebSphere. So if you have a bunch of WebSphere applications, then our platform can manage those applications for you. So if you have a, an application that normally will run on WebSphere, you can upload that application to our platform and our platform will deploy it efficiently for you without you having to worry about that. Any other questions? All right, Matt, you're up. As you know, there are a lot of public cloud providers. Uh, obviously, the big boys, AWS, Azure's pretty big too. Google's kind of taking a different route from things, and I actually really like the route that Google's taking. So I thought I'd go into it a little bit. Um, I call this rolling on Google products because my interpretation of their strategy is that what they're trying to do is build really awesome new capabilities, new software that's never existed before to support their core business. Then, once they get a certain level of maturity and people start catching up, they seem to be open sourcing the technology that allowed them to do that business in the first place. 
And when they do that, they're doing it as a clean rework. So they're not taking something that uh, they're using every day in production. They're throwing out all the crud and building something really great and getting it back in the community. Uh, the tenant is what's called a public project, not as a line of business. And that's an important uh, point because it means that they're not trying to put their ideas in there to make money. They're trying to build a community around it, which is the real big part of what they're doing with open source. They're trying to build this ecosystem of stuff that's using Google-like ideas, uh, that's maybe adding new ideas on top of them, and really tailoring them to the way the community wants to use those systems. And finally, once everybody's kind of gotten in there, they want to have the best way for you to host them in the cloud. Uh, <clears throat> so their core business is stuff. It's gadgets, it's apps, it's search, it's mobile. And the two most exciting things to me out of the I.O. announcements uh, were the, uh, the Google Home initiative and the Allo app. The reason they were exciting is that they're based on this idea of Google Assistant. You know, this slightly Orwellian, but very exciting idea of building conversations between people and Google systems. Uh, the conversation is a big deal. Uh, right now when we talk to systems, we tend to ask them things in their language, and they tend to respond to them with the way that they think they're supposed to, to, to handle that response based off of some finite state machine. Uh, and they're basically really simple mappings. Uh, getting into a conversation where you can talk to a, com uh, a computer the way that I talk to you uh, is going to allow us to have some really interesting and powerful new applications and software. Uh, what's more, in order to do that, you have to have a stateful conversation. And developers right now are obsessed with stateless, uh, pushing everything out as far as they can, uh, building what are called 12 factor apps that have absolutely no state stored on them. And that doesn't necessarily make the world a better place, it's just easier right now to develop. And finally, things are predictable. So when you go to use the app, it's going to be different than when I go to use the app. Uh, because the app knows what kinds of things I like. Uh, to date, the best example of that is ad targeting. So seeing systems that can take that same level of complexity and apply to things we actually want in our lives is really exciting. So, uh, what, happens, so what happens when they start thinking for us? Well, I guess we'll find out, right? Uh, <laughs> In some circumstances, it's a good thing. I mean, I, I get woke up every morning. I would just love to sleep in. <laughs> but the, maybe I get a tap on the shoulder of the computer and say, you stay probably better. should go to work. Yeah, stay better, I'll take care of today. You better. <laughs> I know you're going to all back the house, that kind of thing. Uh, but there's this thing in uh, the pop world called the order of pizza fallacy, where you think, oh, it'd be so much easier if I could just talk to a bot and order a pizza. And by the time you get done typing what you're looking for, one of these uh, state machine based bots has got to ask you a hundred questions. Okay, you'd like a pizza, is it a large pizza? All right, no, a small pizza? Okay, a small pizza. What do you want to have on it? Pepperoni. Okay, what do you want to have on it? Okay, cheese. What do you want to have on it? Okay, sauce. What do you want to have on it? Okay, nothing more on it, okay? Uh, where do I send it? What, what is that? I didn't understand your address. It wasn't in exactly the format that I needed. And at that point, you're like, I can just click the button. Why don't I just click the button bot? So, how do you get the conversationality from this state machine based, flow driven world? And the answer is you need machine learning. And Google recently open sourced a couple of really interesting things. They open sourced a uh, machine learning framework called SyntaxNet, which is about building models of human syntax. And they built a model of the English language that they call Parsemic Parsemics. It's driven by uh, like the greatest works of English literature or something like that. And it has something like a 94% accuracy rate. It can figure out what a sentence means within 94% of its actual meaning. Uh, and that's interesting because linguists are only 96%. So like there's 2% that human, humans are adding at that point. Uh, so it's a way to kind of teach computers of how to manage the ambiguity of conversation. Um, it can be used to build models of the way people speak and the way that they write. And more importantly, it used to be able to model of an individual speaker. So uh, I tend to speak pretty quickly. Your brains right now are hopefully adjusting to that uh, so that you can uh, you know, take in the meaning of what I'm saying. The computer would have known ahead of time that I'm a fast talker, sped up its processing and put me on the best hardware so that when I talked to it, it knew what to handle. Um, if you're a person who you know, uses a lot of slang or reads words out or knows a 
it helps to have something that knows that you do that, knows how to find the signal within the noise and deliver a better experience. Uh, finally, like highly accurate conversational parsing allows you to find what's missing in sentences that are partial sentences. And that's the way we talk most of the time. We don't say long-winded verse, chorus, verse sentences. We tend to say, yeah, the pizza, one pizza. So the first half is talking to your teenage son, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's what they call the parsing. The parsing is right. Uh, so the way that this works is it takes a sentence like Alice drove down the street in her car which actually has two different meanings. It could mean, well, she drove down the street in her car, what would really mean it? Or it could mean, there's a street in her car for some reason, and she's driving down that. A computer has no way to tell ahead of time which one is which. And even if it gets all the words correctly, it still thinks these two are equivalent. So what the SyntaxNet system does is it takes that sentence, it breaks it down, and then pushes it through a machine learning engine to figure out what's more likely to be correct choice for that speaker in that culture and environment. So what standards do you develop by opening this? Well, it's going to really up the game for the expectation that bots and other systems are going to be conversation driven. Uh, it provides a model for processing written text, and that model can actually act as an example for building new models. So if you look at this written text model, you can then say, ah, I know how I would do this for French, I know how I do this for a spoken text, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, there's a way to build new brand new models uh, called Syntax. And this is built on top of another piece of technology called TensorFlow. So how do you help engineers model users and make predictions about them faster? Uh, that's what TensorFlow is about. TensorFlow is a framework for defining, executing, and training machine learning models. Uh, is specific to the problem of training the model. Like you don't have to build from scratch, you know, go get a bunch of libraries to do machine learning and go figure out how they're going to interact and build something that's going to parse it with a certain format of file. It handles all that and puts you in the position of taking models and then chaining together uh, methods in them. So it allows you to build predictive models of complex human behavior, and preferences, and schedules, and, and your speech patterns. And it's going to enable interfaces that adapt to users' cultures and interfaces that improve over time. Uh, in order to explain what TensorFlow is, uh, I had to figure out what a tensor is. I'm still not entirely sure, but basically it's a multi-dimensional data structure that represents one form of data, let's say uh, a matrix of images. So each image gets a position in a gigantic array. And then it says, okay, let's cast that matrix of images along a dimension. Let's say, let's take a single noise comparison. And that becomes an additional dimension along the tensor. As you add more and more and more dimensions, you get much, much larger data sets. And each of those dimensions is going to have, for every entry, an answer to some question. It's an inherently parallelizable task. And at the end of the day, you can ask really simple questions based off of access to that, that, that uh, array structure. What's a flow? A flow I actually do know what that is. Uh, it flows a way of programming where you define the stages of a processing graph rather than actually implementing the stages of a processing graph. So uh, rather than writing hello world, you would pipe into a hello writer, which pipes into a world writer, and then later you would execute that flow and you get hello. The reason that you write the flow-based programming language is that by abstracting away the details of how something's actually going to execute, you can execute that thing in a lot more places and with a lot more parallelism than if you're saying, write hello, right? So the standard that's being developed with this technology is a way for engineers to focus on machine learning problems using standard tools and just understanding how machine learning works. You wouldn't necessarily need to be um, like a parallel systems programmer to be able to use it. Uh, models become tradable. You can download Parsi with Parspace, somebody can mark it up as Marky McMarkface, and you all can hit that and go use it. Uh, tradability and portability of models makes it easier to hack on models and make interesting new machine learning models of behavior or whatever they've got. Uh, finally, uh, visualization and tools using the flow based syntax uh, uh, are going to like, come out of the community and they're going to improve the time to market. 
So they won't be long before you're dragging and dropping to create machine learning uh, engines. And the real reason that they're doing this is because they're going to be the best at hosting. Uh, they're introducing very soon a Google machine language cloud. Uh, I don't think pricing has been announced yet, but uh, at Google I.O., they kind of like as a side sidebar, mentioned that they built brand new processors to be able to do this stuff. Uh, they're called tensor processing units. Uh, and they make use of the efficiencies that are inherent in, in doing the kind of programming they're doing. Uh, they allow them to use uh, what we call chips that are much more parallelizable, that have lower accuracy, but result in quicker answers to tensor-based problems with much lower uh, heat and energy cost. So finally, how do you build stateful systems in a world of continuous failure and unpredictable load? Uh, that's actually the question I've been trying to answer my whole career. And Google's answer to it is something called Borg. Uh, Borg is a piece of software that allows them to treat their data center as one gigantic uh, like program that they're adding stuff to, they're asking questions of, and the program is going to handle the scheduling of how things are going to run, how they're going to scale, what happens when the data center catches fire. Um, and if you haven't read the Borg paper, which just came out this year, maybe last year, it's really good. Uh, Borg has influenced a lot of systems, um, notably the marketplace. Uh, Mesos is influenced by Borg, and Kubernetes is influenced by Borg. Kubernetes is the open source answer for Google. Uh, they took what they did for Borg, they stripped off all the varnish, they polished up what was a really nice set of base capabilities for building uh, container <coughs> orchestration systems and cluster management systems, and they published them as a, as a Pretty simple to install a program called Kubernetes. Uh, what's it used for? Well, it's a high leverage set of primitives that produce addressable services on top of Linux nodes running Docker. And we've got more operating system and container formats coming soon. Uh, the high leverage is key. You don't say, I want to run this program. You say, I want to run between 1 and 10,000 of this program. And you don't say, I want to run it there. You say, I just want it to run quickly find the right places in all of my hardware to run it, and just get on, get, make it happen. Uh, once you've done that, your program is going to run, even as systems crash, or you take them offline for maintenance, they're going to move to other nodes within the system. That property of being uh, real-time elastic and handling failure and all that stuff, that's the orchestration and container orchestration. It's about doing the kinds of things that operators used to do all day long, automatically as a result of detecting problems in the environment. It enables management services at a higher level of abstraction. You really can't just say, I would like to have a web service, and your web service is presented. Uh, it lets for automation and scale out, failover, and advanced deployments. The advanced deployments is really exciting. If you've ever done a rolling deployment by hand, <laughs> uh, I watched Kelsey Hightower at KubeCon this year do one on the fly, during the keynote, the software stopped working midway through, the guy just jumped right in. <laughs> and you wound up getting the team to play it anyway. It was really impressive. Uh, I've seen two teams fail for six months on the problem. Uh, so the new stuff that came up in Kubernetes 1.2, persistent volumes. There's a way that you can create a container, which is supposed to be an ephemeral temporary thing. It's just a Linux process. But you can create one with storage that's very direct. You do that by giving it access to your storage provisioning layer, and it takes over from there. Uh, we have rolling deployments. There's cross-zone stuff that they're introducing, which means that uh, far from just managing one cluster, you can manage the interaction of one cluster to another cluster. Uh, they have built-in uh, uh, support for TLS and load balancing at the wire. So you can actually build, build a set of services and say, load balance these and make them sticky. Uh, so that when someone calls in, we strip off the TLS varnish, it becomes a regular request, we can find out where it's going, we can route to the right system for that user, and they feel like they've always been talking to that process, even though there was something in the way. Uh, node shutdown, the loss of documentation. But the key is that there's a standard being developed here. Engineers now have a way to build uh, scalable firewall systems with nothing more than Docker images and configuration. They don't need to go in and manage any specific switch. They don't need to call IT. They can just take the configuration. 
And this stuff should run any place in Kubernetes. Uh, scaling, rolling deployments, failover, all this stuff is kind of built into the framework. Uh, short term statefulness is provided through load balancers. Uh, long term uh, statefulness is not quite there, but it's becoming less of an adding pattern than it used to be. It used to be if you were putting up a database inside a container, people thought you were amazing and called it over what uh, By the end of this year, if not by the end of next year, uh, people will be using stateful containers and it will be perfectly acceptable. And what that means is we're kind of arriving at this new kind of software. Things that were designed to work in elastic clouds and sort of, of, of computer clusters that are built that way from the beginning. They're using Docker, they're just configured. And so we kind of gave this a new, this new class of technologies a name called cloud native computing. And there's a foundation that supports its development, like the Apache of uh, uh, it's called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and Kubernetes was the first part that, uh, that joined. So I'm not good at any slideshow, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to say that uh, a friend that recently acquired a Kubernetes company. They're called Kismatic. Uh, we're going to be offering, and there's a sentence here, we're going to be offering a, an enterprise version of Kubernetes, and we're also going to be offering uh, support. And we're going to be building all kinds of cool stuff on top of it. And Something that's kind of, I'm kind of excited by, we're working hard to bring Kubernetes to Windows Server containers, which are coming out later this year. So Kubernetes will be able to access both Linux-based clusters and Windows-based clusters and manage software on either side. Uh, and it works. Don't even laugh. I thought it was crazy, but I've seen it. Anyway, so uh, thanks. <laughs> That's what's interesting about Kubernetes at the moment. Uh, Google isn't really driving. It's being driven heavily by the foundation. Google invests some time into building it, and they continue to put some developers on top of it. Well, who's the major players? The major players in that space are Red Hat. IBM. Uh, IBM's got a little bit in there. Uh, Red Hat's the big one. Red Hat and CoreOS are both really heavily into Kubernetes. So we're kind of just shifting in. It still gets Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's more that once you've got two or three players that are working with uh, equal amounts of check-ins into, into a product, that's what the community is. Right. Like, there's always going to be big players and small players, but it's different than some of the other systems that are out there in this space where there's one Mesosphere contributing to Mesos. There's one Docker contributing to all the Docker tools. And they're making good stuff, but they're making good stuff based on their roadmap and so forth. We, as a relatively small software company, uh, can join this group, do something big like add Windows support, and we get the same level of support as the right now. And it's really kind of fun to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the developer community is like, super lively. They're all people who uh, narrowly missed going through operations help because they found good things. So it's interesting. Easy to run. In fact, the, uh, the Google tutorial has you up running in no time flat because when you run this stuff on Google, you don't actually run the Kubernetes clusters. They run on your like, behalf, and then I'll try to get more. I mean, you need to see a demo. Stop by some time. Just go to bed. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. And I think what we'd like to do just, um, you know, kind of invite you to hang around and get involved in like small group discussions about the areas of interest. We'd like to tour around and maybe talk to you to find out like what you're most interested in kind of going forward with to interact with each other on um, the long term projects or where you're particularly most interested. You've seen a lot of like the front end design, mobile. We haven't talked about IoT too much. We've talked about back end technology, cloud platform. So we, we've gotten a pretty good sampling of things. Um, so. I guess I'd say just maybe mingle a little bit with this information and see who you're interested in talking to and on what subjects, and we'll come and find out um, how we can best serve you guys. Okay? Thanks.